Um, so tonight's going to be a really fun night. Um, we're doing a fresh sutra tonight. And when I say fresh, I mean fresh. I'm very, very excited about this Surata Paripricha Sutra. So the Surata Paripricha Sutra is the, that's the Sanskrit title. But this, of course, is another of the jewels, another one of the jewels in the heap of jewels, the Ratnakuta Sutra, so that pile of jewels that we've been going through. This is actually Sutra number 27, if you're kind of paying attention to those things. And this is about Bodhisattva Surata. Um, and this is our Bodhisattva Surata here in the red cloak. Um, so this is Bodhisattva Surata's Sutra. Uh, that's one way to just read this is that's Bodhisattva Surata Sutra. If we wanted to dive a little deeper into the Paripricha, Paripricha, I mentioned this, I think last week or at some point when I was talking about all of these jewels, all of these 40, 49 sutras that are part of this collection, they're sort of of different types. You get your lion's roars, right? You get your predictions of enlightenment. Um, and then one of them that you get are a bunch of the Bodhisattva so-and-so's Paripricha Sutra. If you go digging superficially into Paripricha, it would be the, the questions of so-and-so, the questions of Surata. But you go digging in even a little deeper into this word Paripricha and you realize, oh, wait a minute, these people, it's like, it's interesting. It's not so much a Q and A. Um, and just for anybody who's interested, there's a really kind of interesting connection here between this word Paripricha and an apology but in the traditional classical sense of an apology. So like early Christian apologists, these were post Jesus, early era of the Christian movement. And they were people who were sort of making their case for being Christian. They weren't apologizing for it in that sense of like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. No, no, they were explaining it. And so in a, in a, originally, actually, this word apology was a laid out explanation of like why you should believe something or why it's logical to be this, this, and that. There's sort of some crossover with that idea of, and paripricha, and we'll see that tonight. This is about Surata's, Surata's discourse. I, in, in many ways, it's actually not so wrong to say that this is Surata's sutra. Like, he's going to give us the sutra tonight in a way. So that, that'll be interesting to pay attention to that. Um, again, this is a fresh sutra. This is really, really, uh, in my opinion, really exciting. It's kind of like everything that you want in your Eastern wisdom text. You know, we're going to have like pithy quotes. We're going to have a hero. We're going to have all these, this wonderfulness tonight. Um, I'm going to read it. I'm more or less just going to read it almost in its entirety. I've only decided to truncate it a little bit for time's sake here and there. Um, so it's one of those sutras that speaks for itself. It's crystal clear. I'm just going to fill in a few mythological elements that I've illustrated on the board. Other than that, though, I think the only thing that's kind of helpful to know is Surata. The, this Bodhisattva Surata. The name you might notice if you've been, you know, coming to the Dharma doors or studying this uh, Dharma, that a lot of these words have the pre prefix, have the prefix of Su, S U. Uh, Su Maru, like this is actually Mount Maru, sometimes known as Su Maru, the beautiful Maru, something to that effect. Uh, a, uh, one of the stars of many of the sutras is Subhuti. Yeah, Bhuti is kind of this awareness or this kind of enlightenment, and he is this well enlightened or Subhuti. Um, and this is Surata. And Rata is going to be this for tonight. And I needed to tell you this because it's like if you don't know this going into it, it, it just loses a little bit. Surata. 
it's Rata seems to be this kind of easygoing, yielding, gentle, mild, chill. Like when I'm reading through the dictionary, I'm like, oh, it's just, it's just chill. So he's well chilled out. He's like well chilled, well, well, well chilling. Is Bodhisattva well chilling tonight? I think is how we're gonna gonna do it. So uh, here we go. Uh, again, I have a few things that I'm gonna explain as we go along, but this is just a fun story. This is a fun story. So uh, thus have I heard. Once the Buddha was dwelling in the garden of Anathapindika in the Jetta Grove near Shravasti, respectfully surrounded by 500 Shravakas and 10,000 Bodhisattvas and many others. All right? So that's our beautiful segue out of our Vimalakirti, which began with our Anathapindika and this creation of this kind of uh, Jetta's Grove, right? So we're, we're back in Anathapindika's park. And at that time, a bodhisattva named Surata was living in Shravasti. In his past lives, he had planted good roots of all kinds in the lands of innumerable Buddhas. He had served and made offerings to all of those Buddhas and had attained non-regression from the pursuit of supreme, unsurpassable enlightenment. Dwelling in great kindness, metta, he was free of anger or resentment at heart. Dwelling in great compassion, karuna, he never tired of saving others. Dwelling in great joy, mudita, he was always in harmony with the realm of the truth, the dharma datu. Dwelling in great equanimity, upeksha, he saw the equality of misery and happiness. He ate sparingly and always at the proper time. He had few desires and was content. Sentient beings were always glad to see him. Out of his compassion for the people in the city, he constantly taught them the five lay precepts and the eight special precepts. Both with rem sorry. And he urged them to cultivate the paramitas of giving, discipline, patience, determination, meditation, and wisdom. Also, kindness, compassion, joy, and equanimity, and pure conduct. So, this, was, this was his diet. One day, Bodhisattva Surata, surrounded by an assembly of sentient beings, was about to lead them to see the Buddha and hear the Dharma. But, <laughs> Chakra, king of the gods, saw with his clear divine eye that Surata cultivated austerities and observed all the pure precepts, both with remarkable diligence and that he was firm in his efforts to deliver sentient beings. Chakra thought to himself, Surata never neglects to, convol to cultivate pure conduct. Does he intend to usurp my throne? Is he not greedy for kingship and for pleasures? B before I can proceed, if you don't know about Chakra, Chakra Devanam Indra, if you don't know about Chakra, the king of the gods here, I need to take a moment to explain. So this is Chakra Devanam Indra. So sometimes he's called Chakra, sometimes he's called Indra, sometimes he's called Chakra Devanam Indra. Um, he's got a couple of other names too that pop up. Chakra is this old, old Hindu, uh, Indian, god of the indian cosmological system 
this is an idea, you know, of uh, an idea of a, of a, of a divine being or a di of a, of a, of a God. It's an idea that is way before the Buddha, right? This is sort of something that Buddhism comes into as a whole cosmological world about, well, I mean, just to give you a few key players, there's this God Brahma, the creator God who sort of like creates the world and, and sort of sustains it in a way. So he's kind of this sustaining, creating force of everything. But then within the world of, of men and animals and gods and all kinds of beings, there is this like supreme God, indeed the king of gods, who resides at the top of Mount Maru, Sumeru, Right there are these thirty-three levels of heaven that sort of start midway at the midway around the top of Mount Maru and kind of go all the way up to the highest level of heaven. And there's so many things I could tell you about Indra, about Chakra Devanam Indra, but the most important thing you need to know tonight is that Chakra Indra wields a thunderbolt weapon called a Vajra, all right? And this thunderbolt weapon, it, it's very interesting because, I mean, you think of the Greek tradition and you think of Zeus, he, hold, he is a great god, indeed, the king of gods in that tradition, and he holds a thunderbolt weapon. Thor, in the Norse mythology, holds a thunderbolt hammer, also a king of king or king of gods in that tradition. And Chang'o, the Orisha in the, you know, the Yoruban Santeria tradition also carries a thunderbolt weapon and is a god. So I don't want to get into an anthropological thing tonight of what energy, what being, what entity, indeed what god is this that holds this thunderbolt weapon. But in India and that cosmology, they called him Indra. And what's really interesting is that uh, um, a few days ago when I found this, su this sutra and I was like, oh, this is a fresh sutra. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach this sutra. Um, I was talking to my wife and I was telling her about, um, you know, what was going on, this thunderbolt weapon. And when I mentioned Zeus, out of kind of just out of nowhere, she happened to mention, oh, yeah, Zeus, he's a jealous god. He's an angry God. And that struck me that she was just mentioned that not knowing the contents of this sutra, that it begins with Indra being like, why is this Bodhisattva Surata? Why is he generating all this merit? Why is he cultivating austerities? Why in particular, if you caught it, why does he have such a big following? Oh, he's got this big following. He's cultivating austerities. He must want my throne. And so it, it, interesting that across culture, the thunderbolt wielding God is a jealous God and a little worried of our hero here, Surata, right? So it's important to know that about this God, very powerful being, and also this connection with the lightning thunderbolt, which in this tradition is called a Vajra. This is a, the Vajra. This, and I've mentioned it before that in the Buddhist tradition, this becomes symbolized by one of these, right? So this is a Vajra. So that'll, that'll come in a little bit later. Everybody good? Everybody feeling nice about Surata, you know, Bodhisattva, pinnacle of virtue, really. So is Indra thinks, is Surata? not greedy for kingship and greedy for pleasures. With this in mind, Chakra conjured up four strong men who went to the Bodhisattva and abused him with all kinds of foul language, beat him with sticks, hurt him with knives, and threw tiles and stones at him. However, abiding in the power of kindness, metta, and the paramita of kashanti, 
patience. The Bodhisattva Surata endured all this without feeling a bit of anger or hatred. Then Chakra conjured up four more men who went to the Bodhisattva and said, and this is, this is here them, I got them, they're kind of like in these nice suits, they're kind of doing one of these, and they're saying, uh, <laughs> hey Surata, those wicked men that scolded and insulted you with the evil language and harmed you with tiles, stones, knives, and sticks for no reason at all. Why not let us avenge you? Why not let us go kill those men for you? Surata said to them, Good men, do not say such things. Killing is evil karma. Even if someone should cut me to as many pieces as the leaves of a date tree, I would not think of killing them. Why? Because a killer will certainly fall to the plane of the hell dwellers, hungry ghosts, or animals. Even if they were to gain a human body, they will always be detested by other people, even by their own parents. <laughs> Good men. Since all dharmas, all activities and outcomes may generally be grouped into two categories, wholesome and unwholesome. Unwholesome dharmas, unwholesome activities and outcomes lead to rebirth in miserable planes of existences, hell dweller, hungry ghost, animal. While wholesome dharmas lead to, the, to benefit and to blessings. Then Bodhisattva Surata repeated this in verse, saying, As in planting, happiness and misery result from the deeds performed. How can a bitter seed yield sweet fruit? Seeing this universal truth, the wise should think evil doing brings, brings painful results, while good deeds always lead to peace and happiness. Hearing this, the men whom Chakra had conjured up realized that they would never be able to cause Surata to kill, and they at once disappeared. Then Chakra magically produced... <laughs> then Chakra magically produced a huge amount of gold, silver, and all kinds of other treasures, along with some men who brought the treasures to the Bodhisattva saying, hey, you can take these treasures if you like. They're at your disposal. <laughs> at this, Surata told them, good men, do not say such things. Why not? Because the karma of stealing can make sentient beings poor, lowly, inferior, and even helpless. Even, I, even if I were so poor that I could not maintain my own life, I would never take anything not belonging to me. You should know that ordinary people are silly, ignorant, and enveloped in desire. How can a wise person take anything not belonging to them? Then Bodhisattva Surata spoke in verse again saying, One who accumulates billions and is greedily attached to their wealth unable to give it away, is said by the wise to be a man even poor in the world. A penniless man who will readily give whatever he has is said by the wise to be the noblest and richest on earth. The wise, being free from all evil, have forms of perfect magnificence, but fools, due to their transgressions, are ugly, head to toe. The wise persuade others to do good. Fools are always up for evil. <laughs> it is better to be scolded by the wise than to be praised by fools. When they heard this, the men conjured up by Chakra went away disappointed. Then Chakra himself <laughs> went to test Surata taking with him an even greater amount of gold. He approached the Bodhisattva and said, I have been in contention with some people in Shravasti in the court 
of King Prasanajit. I need someone to give false testimony for me. If you can give, if you can give false testimony for me, I will give you all of this gold. <laughs> the Bodhisattva told Sh Chakra, virtuous one, you should know that it is an evil karma to lie. <laughs> A liar lies to himself as well as to gods, nagas, yakshas, gandharavas, asuras, gurudas, kinaras, maharagas, and all other heavenly beings. Lying is the origin of all evil. It leads to rebirth in the miserable planes of existence, to breach of the pure precepts, and to corruption of the body. A liar's mouth will often reek, and his words will be scorned and despised. Then Bodhisattva Sarata spoke again in verse saying, a liar's mouth will give off a stench. He will fall to miserable realms where no one can rescue him. A liar lies not only to gods, nagas, maharagas, and to others. He also lies to himself. Knowing that lying is the origin of all evils, it destroys one's pure discipline and brings one to rebirth in the three miserable realms. Even if you gave me enough gold to fill the entire world, never would I tell a lie. Hearing this, Chakra disappeared at once. Then he ordered his wives, the goddesses Sachi, Surya Prabha, Panchachuda, and others to go to Sarata to test him again by trying to make him break the precepts. Along with 500 other young goddesses, Sachi and the others anointed their bodies with perfumed ointments and adorned themselves with flowers and other beautiful ornaments. They went to the Bodhisattva late at night, saying, We are lovely women in the prime of our life. We wish to share your pillow and your bed so that we may enjoy, so that we may enjoy each other. Looking at those women with his pure, stainless eyes, Sarata said to them in verse, <laughs> Confused and full of impure thoughts, fools are attached to the foul body, filled with pus and blood. All that they desire, though, will quickly perish and pass into naught. Then such fools will fall into the lower realms, the realm of Yama, and there remain. Even if all the women in the world were transformed into goddesses as lovely as you, my mind would remain pristine, innocent of even the subtlest desire. I would regard you all as dreams or even enemies. Sachi and the other goddesses flirted to the utmost, but the Bodhisattva was not in the least stirred to passion. <laughs> Then they returned to the celestial palace of Chakra and told him, We found Sarata to be absolutely resolute. No doubt he will attain supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. Why? Because he is free of even the slightest craving for us. In fact, he abhors us. <laughs> Although Chakra heard this, he was still worried and upset and felt as though he had been shot by an arrow. Again and again he thought, no doubt that Sarata will ruin me and deprive me of what is mine. I must now test him once again to determine his true purpose. With this in mind, Chakra went to Sarata, giving up his conceit and his arrogance. Chakra prostrated himself with his head at the Bodhisattva's feet, and he asked him in verse, Virtuous one, you are most diligent in cultivating pure conduct. What then is your aim? To be a sun god? A moon god? An Indra? Brahma! Do you strive for the throne of any kind in the three realms? Bodhisattva Surata answered in verse, To me, the rewards of being a sun god, a moon god, Indra, or even Brahma, 
or of being a worldly king in any of the three realms. They are all impermanent and insubstantial. How can the wise seek them? Hearing this, Chakra inquired, but if you speak truly, what then do you seek? The Bodhisattva answered in verse, I covet not a single worldly pleasure, but seek only that sublime body subject to neither birth nor death. Tirelessly, I cultivate skillful means to deliver sentient beings so that together we may tread the path to enlightenment. When he heard this, Chakra felt happy and secure and was sure at last that Sarata did not strive for his throne. <clears throat> Overjoyed, he praised the Bodhisattva in verse. You say you wish to save sentient beings? Great is your ambition. Indeed, it is unequaled. May you defeat all demon hordes and realize the ambrosial dharma and thenceforth and thenceforth turn forever the sublime wheel of the dharma. After he spoke this verse, Chakra respectfully circumambulated Surata, prostrated himself with his head at the Bodhisattva's feet, and then disappeared in an instant. It's the end of part one. And just any questions before we move on to part two? Yep. Everybody saw this again. This is his diet of virtues here. You know, anything coming up? It, 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 re it really is just a preamble, by the way, right? Okay. So let's, well, well, I'll I'll get into to part two here, and and then we'll and then we'll have some fun. Um, Michael. Oh yeah, yeah. Hey, Brendan. Is he is he just too good? I mean, are we supposed to are we supposed to mm. like I'll be earnestly like, yeah, buddy, you're just so fucking good. You know, I mean, can we be a little bit like, dude, ease up on the virtue? Thank, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. So. Thanks, Brendan. You saved me once again. So, I I almost let this one slip by. So, if you didn't notice, this is a classic retelling of a key moment in the story of Siddhartha. So, if you know the classic story of Siddhartha, the prince you know, who's, you know, he's given everything from birth, but eventually renounces all the wealth, goes off to seek enlightenment. And then under the Bodhi tree, Mara, the devil, like desire incarnate, ill will incarnate, confusion and ignorance incarnate, Mara comes to the Buddha and challenges him also with temptation basically by a sexuality tries to harm him through which the Buddha gives him the Abhaya Mudra, right? Uh, the, the Buddha Siddhartha gives the ladies the gesture of giving, even the uh, temptation to lie, the temptation of all of these things are reminiscent of the story of Siddhartha. Now, two things are very, very interesting. One is that this is not Mara. This is like God, right? And again, it's, a, it's tricky because it's a certain God that's a little complicated. But there's a certain way in which this God isn't necessarily like bad. He's like angry, jealous, and these things. But there's a way in which even this God is considered sort of like noble, if you will. So it's interesting that this high God, king of gods, is the one doing the tempting, the challenging, not Mara. So that's interesting. But then even more interesting than that, of course, is that this is Surata, Bodhisattva Surata. This is not Buddha, 
Shakyamuni, like this is not the grand historical Buddha, right? This is, this is you and me, Brendan. This is, this is everybody. That is the idea of the Bodhisattva path, is that we too are the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, defeating Mara's hordes and even being tempted by God and being tempted by wealth and being tempted by these things. So this story is a wonderful, uh, important, important. This is not just a retelling of the Siddhartha story. This is that really sweet, fresh Mahayana thing where they're like, oh, we started, we started idolizing this dude. We started thinking that only the Buddha could defeat Mara. We started thinking that only this exalted being from another dimension or another planet or universe could achieve enlightenment. The Mahayana is a response to that kind of level of adoration in that way and saying, and no, 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 time out. The message of that story was that we all are suffering and all have the ability to overcome that suffering. That's the message. So this Bodhisattva path being being presented here, Brendan, it's it's like, no, it's just, it's like, yeah, he's he's pretty special. <laughs> I mean, again, you know, in the beginning. He's a non. He's at the stage of a non-regressing bodhisattva. That's pretty high level. So I think that there's a way in which, a, a la Siddhartha, we're still to read this allegorically. We're still to see this as like, um, the the peak, the pinnacle of virtuous behavior. That even even these people coming and hurting you, you have no ill will towards them, right? We all. I hope we all strive to reach such a point. I, I strive to reach such a point, right? So he does indeed embody the ideal, but the message here is that it's, a, it's achievable. It's not an exalted state by some sublime being in that way. So. And it's not trying to like necessarily like make the lay Buddhist path heroic. It's more like, hey, you know, Yes, this is a human struggle, but not like you don't have to be a demigod or you know or a god to like uh, to 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 not succeed, but to follow this path. Even better than that, yeah. It's part two, part two. Okay. Even thank, better than thank, that. Thanks, Michael. No, thank you, Brendan. Again, you saved me. I almost let that pass by, and it, that's key to seeing the 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 beautiful allegory here. So. Okay, so we've got all our lovely temptations there. Um, part two. The next morning, when Bodhisattva Surata was making his rounds, teaching people in the city of Shravasti, he found a golden bell made at the beginning of the Kalpa, which was worth more than the world itself. So just in case you don't know about a kalpa, that Buddhism and kind of Indian cosmology measures time in these giant epochs, these giant eons, these are, you know, hundreds upon thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years long, these epochs, these kalpas. And there's a way in which time is measured in the oscillations of these kalpas. And so we are like pretty deep in our present kalpa. <laughs> and this just said that Surata woke up the next morning and found a golden bell that was made at the beginning of the kalpa. And it's worth more than the entire world. <laughs> We're going to talk about this bell a little later, <laughs> but... <laughs> Let's just read on. The Bodhisattva held the, the gold bell in his hand and called out at the main crossroads of the city of Shravasti. Who is the most poor in the city of Shravasti? I shall give them this bell. When the oldest elder of the city heard this, he came running at once and said to Surata, I'm the poorest in the city. You can give me the bell. 
Surata told the elder, you are not, you are not poor. And why do I say so? Because in the city of Shravasti, there is someone who is the poorest of the poor. I shall give the bell to him. The elder asked, who is this person? Surata answered, King Prasanajit. That is the poorest person in the city. The elder said to Surata, do not say so. Why? Because King Prasanajit is very rich and very noble. His treasury is overflowing with wealth and precious things that will never be exhausted. Why do you say he is the poorest of the poor? <laughs> so now, now surrounded by an assembly, the Bodhisattva Surata answered in verse, If one has a treasury of billions, and yet due to greed is still unsatisfied, he is like a great ocean, which never has enough of the myriad streams it swallows. Such a fool is the poorest of the poor. If such a fool allows his greed to grow and to spread and to perpetuate, he will always be needy in his present life and in future lives. After speaking this verse, Bodhisattva Surata went with the assembly to see King Prasanajit. And at that time, the king, with 500 elders, was counting and checking the valuables in his treasury. The Bodhisattva Surata approached the king and said, This morning when I was making my rounds, teaching the people in the city of Shravasti, I found a golden bell made at the beginning of the Kalpa, which is worth more than the entire world. At that time, I thought to myself, I should take this bell and give it to the poorest person in the city. And then I thought, the poorest person in the city is his majesty. <laughs> now I want to offer the bell to you, your majesty. Since your majesty is the poorest, please accept it from me. <laughs> See, he's, please. <laughs> Having said this, the, bodhispot, the bodhisattva spoke further in verse. Such a senseless man who is monstrously greedy and amasses riches insatiably, is called the poorest of the poor. Your majesty, you levy harsh taxes and punish the innocent for no reason. Infatuated with your kingship, you never heed the future effects of your actions. While you enjoy power in this world, you do not protect your subjects, and you have no pity for the poor or for the suffering. You indulge recklessly in women's company without any fear of falling into miserable planes of existence. You are not even conscious of your outrageous wickedness. Are you not poor? If one practices mindfulness diligently and delights in self-control, they are called rich and noble with a wealth of goodness bringing eternal peace and joy as a roaring conflagration never has enough wood to consume, so, O oh king, your avarice is never satiated. As the water can always take in more clouds, and as the ocean never overflows with water, so are you, O oh king, never satiated. As the sun and moon incessantly course through space, so you too, O king, will never rest in all your life. A wise person, though, like roaring flames, insatiably devouring wood, never ceases doing good. As the water can ever take in more clouds, and as the ocean never overflows with water, so the wise are never satiated with ever-increasing goodness. Although the throne gives you power, it is, after all, impermanent. All such things are impure. The wise should abandon them. When he heard this, King Prasanajit felt shame and remorse. But he said to Sarata, Well said, virtuous one, well said. 
although you are very persuasive, I still, not, I still do not believe you. Is all that you have said merely your own opinion? Can someone else perhaps bear witness to its truth? The Bodhisattva Sarata replied, The Tathagata, the worthy one, the supremely enlightened one, who is endowed with all-knowing wisdom, is now dwelling near Shravasti, in the garden of Anatha Pindika, in the Jetta Grove, together with the countless gods, humans, Gandharavas, Asuras, and so forth. Do you not know that? He will bear witness that your majesty is indeed a poor man. The king said, Virtuous one, if what you say is true, then I will go with you to see the Tathagata. I will go and listen to his teaching. I will go and take refuge in him and make offerings to him. The Bodhisattva Surata said, Your Majesty, you should know that the state of Tathagata cannot be fathomed by the ignorant, ordinary person. Tathagata is free of all afflictions and all arrogance and has great compassion for sentient beings, knows the present and knows the future through saintly wisdom, protects anyone who has good roots and superior aspirations, even if they are far away. If the Tathagata knows that I wish to convince you, your majesty, he will surely come here and be my witness. Then, in the presence of the king, Surata bared his right shoulder, knelt on his right knee, respectfully joined his palms, and with this verse invited the Tathagata to appear. The Tathagata, with true wisdom, has compassion for all sentient beings. May he discern the depth of my mind and be so kind as to be my witness. The moment the Bodhisattva finished speaking, the ground suddenly quaked and burst open, and the Tathagata sprang from the chasm, surrounded by 500 Shravakas, 10,000 Bodhisattvas, Brahmas, Chakras, gods, Nagas, spirits, and countless other beings. <laughs> Bodhisattva Sarata then approached the Buddha with his palms respectfully joined and said, World Honored One, this morning when I was teaching the people in the city of Shravasti, I found a golden bell made at the beginning of the Kalpa, which is worth more than the entire world itself. And I thought, I shall give this bell to the poorest person in the city of Shravasti. And then I thought, King Prasanajit is the poorest, in the poorest sentient being in the city. He oppresses, he exploits, he cheats, he robs and then harms people unreasonably. He is wrapped in insatiable greed and passion. Therefore, I consider him to be the poorest of men and wish to give him the gold bell. His majesty asked me, you say that I am the poorest. Who can prove it to be true? And I answered, the Tathagata, the great master, the worthy one, the supremely enlightened one, is free of all afflictions, without the slightest trace of hatred, and treats all sentient beings impartially. The Tathagata will prove the truth of my statement. May the world honored one please instruct, benefit, and gladden us all. Thereupon, wishing to subdue King Prasanajit, the Tathagata told him, Your Majesty, you should know that from one viewpoint, Surata is poor and Your Majesty is rich. From another viewpoint, Your Majesty is poor, but Surata is rich. How is this? Why, being enthroned, Your Majesty has worldly power. And your treasury is full of gold, silver, pearls, sapphires, and coral. In this respect, Surata is poor, and your majesty is rich. However, Surata cultivates pure conduct diligently, delights in the pure precepts, 
has left the household life, has acquired great learning, shuns self-indulgent, tirelessly delivers large numbers of beings by teaching them the five lay precepts and the eight special precepts. Any one of these merits is enough to show you that, show your majesty, any one of these merits is enough to show that your majesty is poor, but Surata is rich. Your majesty should know that all the wealth and treasures of sentient beings in the kingdom of Kushala cannot equal one hundredth, one thousandth, one millionth of Surata's treasury of firmness and purity in keeping the five lay precepts and the eight special precepts. Hearing for himself the true teaching of the Tathagata, King Prasanajit abandoned all his conceit and arrogance. Looking up at its surata attentively, he joined his palms and said in verse, How wonderful! You have thwarted my arrogance. You will acquire the supreme body of a Tathagata. I will abdicate my throne in your favor and wish to remain forever among your enlightened assembly. I am indeed poor, and you are indeed rich. Now I know your words are true. A throne is only a cause of great suffering, compelling one to act against goodness and to be reborn in the miserable planes of existence. After speaking this verse, King Prasanajit said to the Buddha, World honored one, I now vow to attain supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. I wish that sentient beings may, sec may be secure, may be happy and free from the bondage of samsara. I will now divide all of my wealth and treasures of gold and silver and so forth into three parts. One portion I will offer to the Tathagata, the world honored one, and to the great assembly of monks and nuns. Another portion I will give to the poor, distressed, and helpless people in the city of Shravasti. And the third portion will be, will be reserved for state use. I will offer all of the gardens, ponds, flowers, and fruit trees to the supreme Tathagata and to the assembly of monks and nuns. May the world honored one be so kind as to accept them. Seeing this occur, 500 elders of Kushala all engendered supreme bodhicitta. Then Bodhisattva Surata said to the Buddha, World honored one, may the Tathagata teach the essence of the Dharma to the assembly so that those who have met the Tathagata may not have met him in vain. The world honored one told the assembly, Good people, there are three provisions of immeasurable merit, merit which cannot be fully enumerated even by Buddha's Tathagatas, let alone by Shravakas and solitary sages. And what are these three? To protect and uphold the true Dharma, to bring forth bodhicitta, and to persuade others to make the unexcelled vow. When they heard this doctrine preached, 500 monks were freed from defilements and achieved a pure Dharma. I, 12,000 sentient beings resolved to attain supreme unsurpassable enlightenment. After benefiting sentient beings by preaching the Dharma, the world honored one together with the monks and all the others who had appeared with him suddenly disappeared. Having seen all this, King Prasanajit was jubilant he gave Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva Surata two garments, each of which cost 100,000 ounces of gold and said, wonderful, virtuous one, please be so kind as to accept these robes. Bodhisattva Surata told the king, your majesty, you should know that I should not take these two garments. And why? Because I have a patched robe which I often hang on a branch in lieu of a closet. No one has ever thought of taking it away from me by fraud or by force. 
Pure are the gifts given by those who are not only free of avarice of themselves, but also cause others not to be attached to anything. At this, King Prasanajit said, If you do not accept them, please, for my sake, tread upon them to bring me the benefit of peace and happiness in this long night of samsara. And for the king's sake, Surata trod upon the two garments. King Prasanajit then told the Bodhisattva, Now you have personally accepted these garments. What is the use of them to me? Bodhisattva Surata told the king, Take these garments to the poor and distressed people in the city of Shravasti, who have no one else to depend on. As instructed by the Bodhisattva, King Prasanajit called the poor people together and gave them the two garments. And when they touched the clothes, the lunatics regained their sanity, the deaf regained their hearing, the blind regained their sight, and the deformed were made whole again, all because of Surata's awesome, miraculous power. The people all said in universe, what can we offer Bodhisattva Surata in return for his great kindness? A voice from the sky told them all, know that you can repay his kindness by offering him flowers, sorry, sorry. A voice from the sky told them, know that you cannot repay his kindness by offering him flowers, incense, food, or beverages. You can do so only by immediately engendering bodhicitta, when the 500 people heard this voice from the sky, they all spoke in verse, now we, as, now we resolve to attain bodhicitta. We shall become perfectly enlightened and teach the superb doctrine to give peace and joy to sentient beings. We delight in enlightenment, in bodhi, for we have obtained the Buddha Dharma. Then King Prasanajit said to Sarata, wonderful virtuous one, Please tell me, when, you, when will you go see the Tathagata? Because I shall follow you. And Bodhisattva Sarato advised him, Your majesty should know that it is very rare to meet a Buddha and to hear the true Dharma. Your majesty should not go alone. Instead, be a good friend to sentient beings and take all the people of the, of the city of Srivasti with you. And why? Because just as a bodhisattva is adorned by the retinue surrounding him, a king should also thusly be adorned. King Prasanajit asked the bodhisattva Surata, What is the retinue of a bodhisattva? Surata replied, To persuade sentient beings to engender bodhicitta, that is the retinue of a bodhisattva, because it causes them to be enlightened. To persuade sentient beings to see the Tathagata, that is the retinue of the Bodhisattva, because they will not be misled. To persuade sentient beings to hear the true Dharma, that is the retinue of the Bodhisattva, because it causes them to have great learning. To persuade sentient beings to see the noble assembly, that is the retinue of the Bodhisattva, because it enables them to have virtuous friends. The four acts of giving are the retinue of a bodhisattva because they attract sentient beings to the Buddha Dharma. The six paramitas are the retinue of a bodhisattva because they enhance the growth of enlightenment. The 37 ways of, to enlightenment are the retinue of a bodhisattva because they lead to the sight of enlightenment. Adorned and guarded by such a retinue, a bodhisattva can defeat, can defeat demon hordes Make the lions roar and ascend to the supreme state. At this, King Prasanajit and the entire assembly were overjoyed. Nine thousand sentient beings were freed from defilements and obtained a clear Dharma eye. And after the Buddha had spoken this sutra, Bodhisattva Surata, King Prasanajit, the gods, humans, Gandharavas, Asuras, and so forth were jubilant over the Buddha's teaching and began to practice it at once with veneration. 
Svaha. <laughs> okay. So, perfect. Lots of time to chat. Questions, answers, ideas, go over some things. You know, wh where do you want to start? Any I have a quick, quick question okay. um, or thought. I was just struck by how in this in this sutra, it, it's you know, Sarata is very much venerated because he's not a householder because he's he's left behind the householding life. That's that's brought up as one of one of his big. Uh, you know, pluses of his, his path. And I'm just wondering how that, um, you know, juxtaposes with Vimla Kirti's life as a, someone in the world who is, you know, uh, sort of not thumbing his nose at, at the monastic path, but it seemed like there was a lot of conversation between, um, you know, him, like Vimla Kirti as, as a kind of a person of the world who's pursuing the Buddhist path. Um, not, not necessarily needing to be an ascetic. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yep. Yeah. Man, I'll tell you, there's a lot to that. So, so the first thing, so yes, it, it says that he's left the household life, but it also says this interesting thing that he's like really excellent at observing the five lay precepts and the eight special precepts which by the way i just wanted to mention those because the text doesn't go over them i would be a um a bad dharma teacher if i didn't go over this these are the five precepts with the three extra bonus ones so there's not another eight if you didn't know there's five and then if you're going to go to a ceremony or you're going to go to a ritual or something's coming up you'll start to observe these three extra ones. So for a lay Buddhist, if lay Buddhists in the audience, these are the five precepts that as a kind of Buddhist sort of observing pure conduct, one, and the language here, by the way, in Buddhism is very nice. It's not thou shalt not. It's the language is abstain from. Try to watch it. <laughs> Try not to abstain from the taking of life. And that's, of course, within the Buddhist world, kind of considered pretty broad. Some, it's sort of strictly murder of human beings. Others take it to be any kind of intentional taking of life and every gradation in between. Abstain from taking what is not given. And I wanted to mention. This word, what is it? At, atadana. Atadana. Taking what is not given. But it's actually a kind of a dana, a form of giving, but it's a it's an atadana. And when I first heard that it was atadana, it, it sounded very onamana poetic to me, like a mother, atata, atata, atadana. So just a funny one there. So the second one is atadana, don't take what is not given i.e. stealing the third one gets the most uh like what did he mean what did he mean by sensual misconduct what did the buddha mean by sensual misconduct usually this is taken as abstain from sex usually um i'm actually kind of a fan of being like abstain from taking life abstain from taking stuff and abstain from taking sex <laughs> right like if it's freely given yeah so there's a and of course if you're a monk again this is no sex but within the lay community this is uh, number three is actually within the lay buddhist community usually taken to mean adultery stay basically one partner type stuff but again i'm not i don't want to get too into all of that interpret it like you like abstain from false speech lying we saw in the story and then the fifth one also a lot of debate about what the buddha meant uh abstain from intoxicants um abstain from drugs 
in particular, the Buddha seems to have been really concerned about anything that would cause sleepy drunkenness. So just consider that in terms of like what the, not the letter of the law, but the message of the law in that way. And then again, if there's a ceremony or a ritual, Buddha's birthday, something coming up, you would then start to do the, the, the monkish renunciatory practice of eating only one meal before noon, kind of doing the monk meal of just eating once a day and trying to do it around midday. You would avoid entertainment, going to movies, going to shows, maybe not kind of watch TV and stuff that week. That would be an interpretation though. And then the eighth one is sleeping in a high fancy bed. Uh, monks, renunciants, are under, they're supposed to basically sleep on the ground, sleep on a mat, sleep really close to the ground. And so sleeping on any kind of raised bed is fine for lay Buddhists. But if you want to have that little monastic, that little monastic kind of feeling, then you do those three bonus ones. Coming back to Eric's question, this, it says that he was really good at observing the five lay precepts and the eight lay precepts. That's weird that they should say that about him, by the way. <laughs> it's just something interesting. So now begins my real answer to your, your question comments about this thing. There's a, there's like this book, uh, called the Bodhisattva, the Bodhisattvas of the Forest and the Formation of the Mahayana. It's a study of one of the Ratnakuta Sutras, just one of them. But it's a, it's a study of your question, actually. It's a study of this forest-dwelling Bodhisattva, the, renunci the renunciation. I, I don't know how to like really put this like it's it, it's so much about vimalakirti and it's so much about a lot of these sutras where it's like they they say explicitly in vimalakirti and then a number of the other ratnakutas they say explicitly that like to become detached from your stuff to become detached from all that that's renouncing the home that's, that's leaving home. And so because they say that, it gets tricky to know when they say this about him, do they mean, now, yeah, they say that he sleeps and he uses his, his uh, uh, robe for a closet and all of that. And so, yeah, he's probably, uh, he's, he's, uh, he's on, uh, what is it? Uh, he's a desolation angel. He's, he's Jack Kerouac on Desolation Peak. The rucks, he's a rucksack wanderer, Jaffe, he's Jaffe Ryder. And what I mean by that is, is if you, so if you know Dharma Bombs, the, the uh, Jack Kerouac book, you know, those, those guys were, you know, Zen lunatics, they were Mahayanists for sure, but they also sort of were into this idea of like going off, do, doing retreat type of stuff. So basically, I, th what I want to say, though, is, is that the, the scholarly opinion is that these guys were like the hardcore dudes. They were like, you know, and I'm kind of like, I don't know. I like they were hardcore because I think they were they <laughs> uh, are unattached to have no, uh, you know, they're hardcore. All right. But I don't know if they're speaking literally, figuratively, allegorically and all of that. And I actually think that the Mahayana move is to kind of not rest, like that it kind of could be either way, that you could be in your house fully uh, having left home, right? Or you could be glamping and you could, you know, be, oh yeah, I, I'm, I renounced, you know, <laughs> but, I, but I'm glamping, so I have my fancy tent and all of that. So you, you didn't renounce your house. So, that's kind of a, you know, a way of, of addressing that. Yeah. So in a way, like they, there's, there's some ambiguity left in there intentionally. That's the, I, be, I believe so. You're hearing that. Yeah, I can see that. Other questions? Thank you. Any questions, comments? Things pop up? Things you like, didn't like? Symbolism? 
Um, also, also just, and if you were about to ask something, just one two seconds. This is also, by the way, a great sutra for outlining the bodhisattva practice. The bodhisattva path is observing the basic precepts, working on the six paramitas, and then rocking your, your Brahma Viharas, rocking your immeasurables, that loving kindness, big compassion, that great joy for everybody, and that equanimity. That's the Bodhisattva path. So. I want to talk about the bell. <laughs> Right. So I do believe that, you know, the first part of the story, part one, is to set Surata up, like Brendan noted, to set Surata up as the like this, you know, really pure virtue of, of, of a pinnacle of virtue. And this kind of interesting story with Indra. But there seems to be like some connection with Indra in this bell. And I just want to tell you real quick, so the Vajra, and by the way, unfortunately, again, this is a sutra that to my knowledge, we only have the Chinese, so working linguistically, we can only kind of go with that. The word Vajra, this, this lightning bolt weapon, interestingly, and, and I've done a lot of, a lot of people have done the work, and myself included, the, et the etymology, the Chinese etymology of this word Vajra, the Jingang, a Jingang, which is a, um, the first character Jin means gold or metal. This is where Chinese gets real tricky. It's so broad that it could just be metal or it could be the precious gold and then gold can be value, right? So gold and then this second character means um strong gold strong metal strong it's like it, you really chinese is a very tricky language that way and so when you start digging deeper um you know eventually this this word you know it has to do actually with this idea this kind of vajra the strength of it that in that well, interestingly, this golden bell is also, it's a, it's a Jin Ling. So it's the same character, the first one, which is a weird character. Again, it has this deep connection. And then without b uh, boring you with all the research I did, you go digging very deeply into the idea of a Jin Ling, of a golden bell and right away you're confronted with the Vajra bell. And I unfortunately don't have a Vajra bell, but you may have seen a set where there is this and then also a bell that has this at the top, but this comes and turns into a bell. And so you hold one and you ring the other. So the Vajra and the bell, the lightning and the thunder, the masculine and the feminine, there's a lot of going on with the bell and the Vajra. This is very much the phallic uh, masculine and the bell is very much the yoni feminine. So part A, part B, the Vajra, the bell. I'm, my suspicion of course, is that this bell is Indra's Vajra in a sense or it's sort of this gift of indra after this first exchange this kind of well again if you think of the bell and what i just told you about the lightning bolt thunder god there's this like really wild idea of bells this is why the tibetan buddhists are so big about their gongs and bells and vajra bells by the way there's this kind of thunderous roar of the dharma that arises from the this idea of a bell and i think that's what's going on here but then there's this 
Then there's this little beautiful extra part about that it's this bell that was made at the beginning of the culpa, right? And of course, more valuable than anything in the world, right? So in the, uh, in the large perfection of wisdom sutra, this is the large Pranyaparamita Sutra. There's a story about Indra giving his Vajra to the Buddha. Like, that basically, if I may paraphrase the story quickly, Indra, Chakradevanam Indra, the jealous, angry god, he was real short-tempered, and he'd bust the Vajra out, at, you know, real quick, and smote you. And very, very similar to the way that Surata pacified Indra. In the large Pranyaparamita Sutra, the Buddha pacifies Indra as well, and, the, and Indra gives him the Vajra. He puts down the Vajra. <laughs> and, the, and of course, the Buddha is not going to go around smoting people. And so part of the Vajrayana, part of the Vajra tradition of Buddhism is to sort of reflect on and meditate on the centrifugal power and energy of lightning and thunder. <laughs> it's like this idea of like, rather than using this, you sort of reflect on it in a way. So that's interesting about that. I'm gonna suggest about, about the, um, the Pranyaparamita story of the Buddha receiving the Vajra. I'm kind of reading this as a retelling of that story, retelling of Siddhartha, retelling of those aspects of the story. And so this bell, I mean, basically, you know, whatever. Um, it's the Dharma, right? It's the true Dharma. That is what's worth then more than any, that's worth the entire world. It was made at the beginning of time it was made at the beginning of the Kalpa. And isn't it very, very sweet and lovely that Surata wants to give the true Dharma and the bell to Prasanajit? Isn't that nice that he wants to give him the true Dharma and teach him the Dharma? Right? <laughs> so I, that, I, that sort of was for me the key for tonight is that you kind of see that beautiful allegorical story right and then i you know i drew my uh you know this is a, a maggie's farm i believe this is maggie's farm right and so uh this is king prasanagajit's treasury right he's got the ar the armed dudes out front you know i tried to draw some snipers the barbed wire the you know and so this is, this is what I meant at the beginning, that I think this sutra is so fresh because of this idea of like, what is wealth? What is poverty? What are we talking about? Who, yeah, who's, who's actually the wealthiest person here? The person who's afraid that lives behind bars? Or the person that lives behind a... A, a closet of his robe and, and, and has no fear of any, what is that great line at the end, right? Where he says, oh no, I don't want those robes, right? Because I have this beautiful patched robe, which I often hang on a branch in lieu of a closet. No one has ever thought of taking it away from me by fraud or by force. <laughs> so it's this really de deep, you know, Dharma, deep message of, of like, what are we valuing here? What is value? What are we valuing? What do we consider wealthy? And in particular too, I might just sort of throw into the hopper, what are we jealous of? Are you jealous of material wealth? Are you, when you go through Instagram, are you jealous of the things you don't have, the things that you want? And then are you jealous of those people that have them? Right? Or do you come across Surata's feed? You come across at Surata, and he's like, <laughs> you know, and he's like, and like oh man, look, I want to be Zaretta, right? So it's a really, really deep, I, I was going to, you know, joke at some point, this is a sutra that tumbles, you know, crumbles empires. 
you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, it's a beautiful story that the king personage it abdicates, abdicates the throne. And he's like, you're right. I'm done. You know? Yes. We hope we wish we pray that that moment will happen, right? Where they wake up and they're just, they abdicate, right? Abdicate their, their thrones. But it's not even about reaching, I think, personage it and that right because it's about you and me and it's about what do we value my my point is you know that surata was trying to to do personage at a solid you know he's actually trying to go hook him up right and so there's this this beautiful again it's just this beautiful message about what do what is real wealth and what is real poverty you know I get all worked up. Are there are comments, questions, ideas, favorite parts. Sim simple little sutra, really. Small question: What yeah. what was the significance of um, Sarata walking over the garments? Yeah, right. Very interesting. Um, of course. It's in with Buddhist texts and things. I think it's always helpful to remember. Um, I guess you, I would call it guru culture, um, where you know, touching the guru's feet, putting the head at the guru's feet. Like, there's a lot of guru culture, and you know, in in Buddhism, it gets interesting because they are aware or they think that you know about guru culture, and then they are always kind of playing with it in that way because they don't actually want i think want you to uh obviously worship another human being in that way uh in in that way um and so they're always playing with it and so i my understanding of it is a kind of guru thing where he's this uh person and that he has blessed the garments by uh putting his feet on them that seems to be a pretty you know i'm not I, taking any uh, leaps in making that read on it What's really interesting, of course, though, is that I don't know if you are all familiar with the biblical story of Veronica. Veronica is this woman in the, in the it's kind of an apocryphal story. I don't think it's a gospel. I, you know, I'm not a Bible scholar in that way, but there's this woman, Veronica, that on, um, as during the stations of the cross, as Jesus go, is going up and he's carrying the cross, there's this woman, Veronica, that takes a, a shroud and kind of wipes his face of the blood from the crown of thorns. And Jesus's face is left imprinted on the garment. And then it is said that that garment, uh, the blind get to see, the crippled are here, the deaf are, there's this very similar biblical thing going on that, you know, I'm not interested in doing that type of uh, cross cultural stuff, but I point it out because some of you might want to, you know, uh, follow these breadcrumb trails. Right. So there was that interesting part about that. Um, that's my little interpret interpretation. Anything else? Are there a lot of instances in these sutras of monks having miraculous you know, sort of Christ-like powers, making them healing the lame and the blind, and that's is that a that a universal thing that goes through? It's pretty common. I mean, I wouldn't say that it's as like um, important in these texts, but it is a theme that you will see. Um, yeah, and actually, during the Vimalakirti series, there was a number of biblical references that I just stayed away from, um, but there's a lot in there. And as far as the breadcrumb trail goes, who's taking from whom is a very interesting question. And all I can tell you on that note, and okay, so I, I will say this about it. I will say this about it. The Buddhists have a much better paper trail for where they get these ideas. <laughs> If you know what I mean, that there's like many sutras and then you can trace these sutras back. And it's like, again, a paper trail. In the Christian tradition, these things kind of pop out of nowhere. And it's just like, well, it was Jesus. He's God's son. You know, he's just so smart. He's, it's like, 
yeah, but this, I don't see these, uh, I don't see these in the, in the Torah. I don't see these in the, in the Jewish scriptures. <laughs> Where are these new fangled metaphors coming from, Rabbi? So I, I again, I'm not going to say who's, who's coming first. I, don't, I think that's kind of actually kind of a lame um, uh, interest. It's what I call originitis, the sickness of needing to know what was first or what was original versus being delighted in ideas, right? <laughs> so. Um, yeah, um, uh, one last point about my board that I forgot to mention was, of course, this amazing moment where the ground opens up and the Buddha out of the chasm <laughs> arises. And I, I couldn't draw all of the Nagas, Yakshas, Maharagas, and Gandharavas. And so I just made him on our heap of jewels our pile of jewels coming out of the chasm of the earth, right? There's also some very interesting, you know, significance to that, of course, right? You have an argument. You have a division. Prasanajit sees it one way. Surata sees it another way. So you have a divide. Oh, you have a divide, do you? The Buddha arises out of that dualistic, <laughs> out of the divide, and establishes peace and harmony, right? And I might add, uh, should, we, should we be, we shouldn't be surprised. The diplomat, of course, this, this wisdom, it's, it's wisdom, right? But it's also very diplomatic. And I, I, re, I would just suggest everybody interested in um, kind speech, everybody interested in this, pay attention to the Buddha, right? Prasanaji, you're right. You're right. From your point of view, you are wealthy. Yeah. Right? You're well, you are wealthy from that point of, from, if you, that's your criteria for wealth, yes, you're right. <laughs> But there's another point of view. Let's let's just think about that other point of view for a second, King Prasanjit, right? From another point of view, wealth is this, 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 and that, and Surata's got it in spades, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> so it's this beautiful thing where he diplomatically says, which, by the way, of course, um, in terms of drishti's views, points of view, this Buddhist idea of a drishti, right? That's some heavy dharma to say, yeah, from that, from that definition of wealth and poverty, you are right. And you're right to think so. You're right to think you are rich in, in that criteria. But again, from a different worldview, a different drishti, from Surata's drishti, whoa, whoa, yeah. Right, it's a very different worldview in that way, and of course, the Buddha sides with Surati. Well, he sides with truth. He tries sides with the Dharma in that way, um, and of course, the truth wins over Prasanajit, five hundred elders, and everybody else. So, again, just to share with you how this sutra was working, if you didn't kind of notice that beautiful. You know, just the, the, it's a story about division, non-duality even, right? And it really, I think this is probably my favorite line. I, I know that often Buddhist sutras, you know, I, I try, you know, these classes are an hour and a half long. And it sometimes takes us an hour and a half just to like get to a certain place. And so like the next day to your friends, if you're like, class was great, you got an hour and a half, maybe we can, you know, arrive at that mindset. So I know that these sutras are, what I'm trying to do is share with that, share with you the beauty that comes from the, the long, uh, slow digestion in that way. So a lot of times these sutras don't, they don't have those pithy fortune cookie little, the little one, the little sayings, right? 
This one was full of them, and I want to share with you my favorite, if I, if I might. Right? Yeah. It's better to be scolded by the wise than to be praised by fools. <sighs> that's, that's the lesson. That's the lesson. All right, folks, if there's no more questions or comments. What, one, one last thing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, and I, I wrote in my notes, at one point there's a flip on the imagery. Do I recall like the water and the ocean and the, was it the light? Can you, because I didn't so, write them down. What a flip, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's this one where he says, that he's talking about the insatiability of the king. And he says, J -j 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 yeah. So, so talking about the insatiable greed, the insatiableness of the king, he says, as the water can always take in more clouds, as the ocean never overflows with water, so you too, king, are never satiated. As the sun and moon incessantly course their pace, you too, always, always. But then he flips it and uses the exact same language and says, and as the water can never take in more clouds and the ocean never overflows with water, so the wise are never satiated with ever increasing goodness. Right? Oh, and I missed that actually the first one which was as a wise person though, like roaring flames, insatiably devouring wood, never ceases to do good. So it's and, a group, please, yeah. please. And, and then the flip of that was, it, anyway, but yeah, I, I love those. Cause it's like, wait, he's using the same words, but it's exactly the opposite. You know, it was a real trip and how effective that was actually is it oddly effective. Uh, <laughs> method to convey the idea i i dug that that was dope. i'm i'm very glad you picked up on that um yeah in fact when i was first reading it i did the double take where i was like wait a minute but i thought un insatiableness was bad and it well not if it's for the dharma right no. and again yeah that's a beautiful mahayana twist to this so thanks juicy all right folks I'm going to turn it over to Katie for some announcements. Okay. Thank you, Michael. That was a very timely sutra to be reading this week. So that was awesome. Thank you. Um, so I put some links in the chat. As usual, you're invited to practice jhana. Um, if you can do that from a place of freely giving. Um, so there are links to do that in the chat. Um, but your presence is the best thing that you can bring to the Sangha. So thank you all for being here. And um, MC Owens will be back on the ones and twos this Friday um, for a talk uh, about Buddhist uh, models of money. So Buddhist monastic ways of dealing with money, Buddhist models of money. Um, and so that's going to be interesting, particularly given the context we have now from this sutra. What is it to be rich and how have Buddha's been thinking about that? So that's on Friday. And on Saturday, um, if you guys don't know this, we have a monthly Q Sangha um, that's open to anyone who self-identifies as queer or questioning. Um, and that is one Saturday night a month, and that's this Saturday. Uh, so details are on our website, and uh, all are welcome. So see you back here on Friday. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody.